Good evening everyone, time for another member update. We'll start out here with the Bitcoin chart and you can see this is the Huobi price which is 792 in US dollars and you can see a confirmation of a breakout of this uh, cup and saucer or pendant formation and you can see now we have tested the old high uh, not the oldest high but a recent old high from back in June and we have tested back to the line and we're now rising if we jump over to Bitfinex you can see that we're in US dollars on the US exchange we haven't yet exceeded that high which is about seven hundred ninety dollars and we're sitting about 773 but again China has already exceeded that so for the rest of the night we're going to be talking about this fascinating article on silver doctors it's an analysis of what is happening in India and I think probably goes into what the elites have planned or trying to bring about and it appears that the, their window is closing uh, for them to usher in what they would like to have, I think, which is going to be a cashless society. So, But let's uh, go over to the gold chart here. I wanted to show you something on the gold chart. Now, this is probably the best one to show what I'm talking about, and this is gold in Canadian dollars. And you can see uh, it's right at the election that we get this move. Uh, it was actually a classic move right here. If we draw in the lines, we can see that it was a classic breakout from really this top, this kind of uh, cup and saucer, or whatever you want to call it. It was a, a classic buildup um, going up right there. So that's a pretty textbook pattern, but look at the reversal. Very high volume. And uh, ever since, right there at the election, um, they took it and they smashed it. Now you can't see the volume as much on this chart but if we pull out to the daily you can see that that's actually the greatest volume well not on the Canadian dollar we have some back here but on the other charts it is the greatest volume we've ever had right at that reversal. Now let's go and look at uh, gold in the Australian dollar. Um, you can see same sort of thing. Look at that spike right on the reversal. Uh, it wasn't going to break out. It had already broken out. You can see that uh, it had already broken out. At one point, gold had made new all-time highs in the Australian dollar. And we get this reversal. Here is gold in the euro. And back to the daily. And you can see, there you go, the biggest volume move ever. Same thing in the Great British Pound, that massive spike reversal. Again, gold was about to break out to all-time new high prices in the British Pound. And now we have this massive push by the powers that be ramping up the paper, uh, the paper pressure on the price of gold. And now here is the US dollar gold chart. Uh, back on the daily you can see uh, record record volume right there right at the election the very day of the election and a massive move we're talking about 1350 down to 1177 we're talking about over a 10 percent uh, loss in the value of gold maybe 15 percent loss in the value of gold since the election so they're very desperate. Uh, they're ramping up their action because, as I think if you look at the article here that we're going to read, it may be that their window is closing to get these things done. So this is an analysis behind why they tr they're trying to crush Indian gold demand. This is by Stuart Doherty, and this is very good. I'm going to read the whole thing. Indian demonetization denotes severe stress in the global gold market. It is becoming clear that the Indian currency demonetization is actually a planned attack on Indian gold demand launched to disrupt gold prices and discredit gold as an asset class. The attack was required to alleviate severe stress in the global gold market that is becoming increasingly difficult for the deep state controllers to contain. For two decades, physical gold has been migrating from the west to the east in increasing quantities. 
Numerous reports cross-confirm that world's leading refineries are operating at capacity to convert Western gold into the kilo products demanded by Asian buyers. Refiners also confirm that the sourcing of Western gold has become problematic as the supplies dry up in the face of voracious world and particularly Eastern demand. Western central bankers and their deep state handlers have made it clear that they intend to transition to a cashless society. However, they are not yet ready to make this transition. Therefore, their current focus is to start the process by eliminating high denomination currencies such as Euro 500, US 50, and 100 notes. At the same time, they are working to digitize the payment infrastructure, a prerequisite of the elimination of cash. Their problem is the steady awakening of the people to the disturbing implications of a cashless society. And that's right, those are very disturbing implications. Anybody who's interested in freedom should fight against the cashless society with everything they have. And to the assault on human liberty that it represents, the deep state oligarchs must implement their agenda before the people mobilize to prevent it from being imposed upon them. The deep state oligarchs understand that the Western governments they commandeer are bankrupt. To continue operations, they must tap into people's private wealth for funding. In fact, the IMF has produced a position paper recommending a, quote, one-off capital levy of 10%, a 10% wealth tax, to deal with Western governments' intractable fiscal problems. The authors of this paper state that the levy must be imposed at night, and by total surprise to prevent citizens from being able to take any steps to avoid it. This type of ambush is exactly what just happened in India with its shock demonetization. The IMS proposal does nothing to change government's current trajectory of greater deficits and debt. The money raised would simply be used to service existing debt. This means the first capital levy will just be one of many going forward. Government's only solution is to expropriate the private wealth of the people, which is exactly what the IMF has admitted. If people have cash and other private monetary assets outside of the banking system, when the capital levy is imposed, governments will lose out. This is one of their primary motivations to eliminate cash in order to maximize proceeds from the capital levy. They need the greatest possible amount of money within the banking system in non-withdrawable, digitized form when the levy is executed. It is not in the interests of governments if people figure out that they are far better off being their own bankers by privatizing their monetary assets than handing them over to commercial bankers who have become wards and enforcement agents of the state. Therefore, a full-scale campaign is underway to demonize cash and to make precious metals appear dangerous by routinely pulverizing their prices. In the meantime, supplies of physical metals in the West constantly diminished are now strained. This means that the bullion banks, LBMA, and COMEX paper price suppression activities must steadily escalate for them to maintain control of a market that is spinning out of their control. Unlike Eastern investors, Western investors tend to buy into rising prices as they chase momentum. Now, this is what I pointed out many times, the difference between fundamental and technical investors. Investors in the East are primary fundamental primarily fundamental investors. They're buying something because it's a good value. It's cheap. Whereas Western investors chase rising prices. That's why uh, I pointed out before they had to stop silver from breaking through $50 because then silver would be at a new all-time high and that would mean that it's a buy, the biggest buy it's ever been. They had to stop that. That's why we had the May smackdown. Rising prices can lead to a buying stampede. If a buying stampede were to break out in today's supply-stressed precious metals market, prices would surge, which would be antithetical to the deep state oligarch's agenda. Given that the deep state operatives can do nothing to increase Western gold supply, their only options are to somehow discover supply elsewhere and or crush gold demand. The sum somehow is India a nation whose people possess an estimated 20,000 tons of gold and who buy hundreds more tons of it each year. Prime Minister Modi, the deep state's establishment 
deep state establishment's captured and controlled facilitator has been instructed to obtain supply and control demand of gold in India and he has been working overtime to achieve both objectives ever since his election. First, Modi launched a paper gold scheme whereby the Indian people were urged to tender their personal gold holdings to the state in exchange for notes and bonds paying less than inflation interest rates on the value of the gold they provided. The notes are irredeemable for gold for at least five years, by which time the gold will be long gone from India and used in the bullion banks, market rigging, and other for-profit operations. Modi's paper gold scheme failed because the Indian people did not trust it, and correctly so. Next, Modi imposed a 10% import duty on gold. India produces next to no gold, so virtually all of it is imported. This resulted in a multi-week strike by jewelers, which did reduce demand, one of the two aims of the deep state oligarch's plan. But shortly, this scheme failed too, because gold smuggling surged, enabling the Indian people to obtain the gold they desire at prices roughly 5% over global spot, reasonable in the circumstances. In a companion effort to crimp demand, Modi enacted a special reporting regulation. Enacted in 2015, it requires anyone purchasing jewelry or precious metals having a value of 200,000 rupees or more, the equivalent of roughly $2,900 US, to present an Indian PAN card. PAN stands for Permanent Account Number, a 10-digit alphanumeric number issued by India's tax department to individuals and businesses. The PAN enables tax Personal, tax personnel to track all of a cardholder's financial transactions over their entire lifetime. Only 17% of India's population have obtained a PAN number to date, meaning that 83% of the population are unable to purchase $2,900 or more worth of jewelry or bullion in a single transaction without a PAN card. It is illegal to do so. This regulation has reduced jewelry and bullion purchases by upscale Indians who do have PAN but do not want their personal transactions permanently recorded. Alternate, alternatively, it has led them to make smaller purchases that do not require a PAN card. While the PAN regulation curbed demand in the $3,000 plus high end of the market, it did nothing to address the vibrant lower end cash market. Smaller purchases of jewelry and bullion have traditionally been paid in cash using 500 and 1,000 rupee currency notes. This was the deep state Achilles heel in India, and they decided to deal with it. Accordingly, on November 8, 2016, in a shock move, Modi extinguished all Indian 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. Holders of the old notes have been required to exchange them for new ones, but the process has been extremely difficult and time-consuming Further, there are sharp restrictions on the amount of new currency citizens can obtain. Withdrawals are capped at 40,000 rupees per week, roughly $575. After paying for living expenses, 90% of Indian purchases are made with cash. Very little is left over for discretionary purchases such as gold jewelry. Given that the demonetization was specifically timed to occur in the middle of the robust festival and wedding season, the reduction in demand has been pronounced. Jewelers in Mumbai, the nation's largest retail market by far report sales being off by up to 90 percent. We believe that the primary objective of the Indian currency demonetization was to sharply reduce gold demand in the world's most important retail market, India, one that is controlled by the deep state oligarchy via a captured agent, its prime minister. The manner in which the demonetization was carried out indicates some kind of desperation because it defied all economic prudence, logic, humanitarian regard, and common sense. India is the only country where this kind of attack on demand could have been carried out, and this is why it occurred there. It indicates to us that the bullion banking cabal is coming up against a wall, and there is a severe supply-demand stress in the global gold market that is rapidly becoming non-containable. Desperate times are producing desperate measures by the manipulators. It is critical to note that the governor of the Reserve Bank of India up until mid-2016, Raghuram Rajan, declined a second three-year term. Rajan was a former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, the Capital Levy People. He is also a member of the Group of 30, along with Larry Summers, the head cheerleader for the elimination of $100 bills in the United States and cash in general. 
Much more important, Rajan has now become vice chairman of the Bank for International Settlements, the so-called Central Bank of Central Banks, and he long regarded and long regarded as the chief architect and enabler of global gold manipulation and price, suppre- price oppression. He has been characterized in the press as being a vocal votary for increased coordination among central banks. Clearly, an important deep state global agenda is now in play. Brexit and the Trump victory have demonstrated that the people can only be pushed so far, but the deep state oligarchs are far too addicted to easy money and godlike power to hear the message. They are pushing forward as if nothing whatsoever has changed in the world. The retention by the people of financial liberty is far more important to them than Brexit or Trump, and we believe they will defend their rights to it, particularly as they awaken to the full implications of the tyranny that will be unleashed by its elimination. As demand rebuilds from the shock demand reduction that has occurred in India, we believe the market for precious metals will become stronger than ever. First, India has discredited government's prize monopoly product, fiat currency. Second, India's demonetization-related gold demand shock has no effect whatsoever on demand from Russia, China, and the rest of Asia, which is stronger than ever. Third, the fiscal and monetary realities of governments throughout the West continue to worsen, strengthening the already compelling case for precious metals. Fourth, and as we have pointed out in previous articles, supply cannot withstand a fractional deployment of liquid personal assets into metals without prices being forced significantly higher than where they are today. And fifth, the bullion banks and deep state schemers are running out of curveballs to throw at the people. In fact, the stunt they just pulled in India might be their last, at least anywhere near this magnitude. While we put nothing past them, including desperate dumping of remaining Western Central Bank metal holdings, which might not even exist at this late stage, and prohibitions that the people will realize they must ignore if they are to have any chance of remaining financially free, it seems clear to us that they are fast running out of options. Stephen Doherty P.S. One additional inference we draw from the events in India is that it almost certainly proves the United States gold reserve is gone. What has happened in India indicates that a critical supply demand imbalance exists in gold, which required an unprecedented, draconian, and reckless solution. Actually, it has solved nothing. It has only bought the oligarchs some time, and probably not much of it. If Western and particularly U.S. gold reserves had been available, they almost certainly would have been deployed before a massive, destructive currency demonetization in the world's second largest nation by population would have been ordered. So, fantastic article by Stephen Doherty on Silver Doctors. I think he's on to something there. It looks like they're getting desperate. You can see the volume in all the currencies that was... uh, that happened exactly the same time that Trump was elected. We now have Bitcoin breaking out into new highs. Uh, these are the only two protections we have against this cashless uh, oligarch paradise, which is going to be a, uh, a living hell for any freedom-loving citizens. Uh, the oligarchs can see that their window is, is rapidly closing. They've got to bring in their cashless society and hence the desperation the moves they're making. And we'll talk to you next time.